Turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 19 today. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Let's pray together as we come to the Word. Lord God, we humble ourselves before you today. Father, we put ourselves subject under your word. We pray, Father, that uh, today in our, our hearts we would hold your word as authoritative in our lives. Help us, Father, to put ourselves last and to put you and others first. We pray, Father, as your word is read aloud that we hear from you. Uh, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit and speak to us today. May I be like a puppet, limp and lifeless, until you fill me with your spirit and speak to us. We want to hear from you today. So we just pray, Father, as we read your word, we would, um, we would take your word, that it would go through our ears and into our hearts, and that it would bring forth a harvest uh, 100-fold. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The word of the Lord. So we're hearing a familiar refrain in Peter, that of trials and suffering. Right? We've been reminded chapter after chapter that that is the natural thing for those in our culture that have said, Jesus is Lord, instead of trying to pretend like I'm in charge of my life and living according to the ways of the world and pursuing all of those and trying to satisfy my appetites, which are never satisfied unless I truly drink of that, which is eternal, Jesus, right? Peter says, trials are going to come. And we notice here in this passage we see here today, he begins with beloved. This marks a transition in the, in the word that we're looking at here. He's kind of winding up this, okay? We're, we're nearing the end of this letter. And you can imagine if you were writing a letter uh, to some family members or some friends and you're sharing several different things you want to tell them about, uh, near the end of the letter, <clears throat> you kind of want to emphasize the most important stuff and leave them with that most important stuff. And so Peter here says, Beloved Christians, brothers and sisters in Asia Minor, Brothers and sisters in Midvale, Idaho today, he calls us beloved. Loved by him, much more loved by God. And so he wants to share this. He's, he says that beloved name of all of us to have us perk up our ears and listen a little bit more closely one more time as he starts to bring this letter to a close. But he says things that we don't really want to hear, Right? Don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. He says, this is a natural thing. It's a natural thing for those of us that live, obviously, in a fallen world, but it's, it should certainly be a natural thing when we live according to the Word of God and not according to the ways of the world. So don't be surprised by it when it comes to us. And we wonder, why? Why is this happening? Why should testing take place? Why should these trials and suffering come upon us, especially if God loves us? He says, beloved, why would these things come upon us here? Well, he says here that 
these trials come because God the Father wants to test us. And I would say because He loves us, He wants to test us. Okay? We're familiar with testing in our world. You could probably think of a bunch of different ways that we're familiar with testing in order to make things good and right. I mean, we're in the middle of summer, and so less of us are involved with school than usual. But before long, some of us are going to be starting our school studies again. Some of us are going to be going back to school, right? And so there's this dirty little thing that happens at school every once in a while called a test. And I tell you, most people aren't very happy when that comes. I have yet to meet a kid that goes, oh, yes, a test is coming Wednesday. I love it, you know? Almost all of them are like, oh, no, a test. Why do the tests happen in our studies? Well, the hope here is that we're going to take everything that we're learning and file it away a little bit more because I want to perform well on that test. I want to have some good test results. I don't want to flunk, right? So testing is a normal thing in school and in studies. How about with athletes? It's a time of testing there. Certainly it happens at every practice as they're preparing to go on. We're thinking of Olympics is in the air right now, right? I mean, those that are performing on the world stage in the Olympics, they tested themselves again and again and again from a very young age in order to become the best in whatever field they're competing in. What about musicians? Learning to play the piano, the violin, singing, right? We test ourselves in order to learn and to get better. How about cooking, grilling? Okay, so on Thursday night when I had some young adults over, when I had young, when we had young adults over, most of the cooking happened because my wife is an excellent cook. But, you know, I hung out on the grill. Um, that's, I heard once that women invented grilling so that they could get men to cook some. I don't know. Maybe that's true with me. But uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, but uh, I was out there grilling, you know, and, and I just had hot dogs. It's the simplest ones. You just kind of basically start them on the left side and you just keep rolling them. But uh, I got distracted, and I came inside, and I was talking with some of them about uh, the Lord of the Rings and stuff, and I'm a, kind of a big nerd about that stuff, and I realized I left all those hot dogs on high, and I came in here, and I've been talking for a while. So some of them were pretty dark, but thankfully most of them like, oh, I like burned hot dogs. They're probably being nice to me, right? But you don't want to eat meat that's undercooked too much. It could make you sick, right? So when I'm cooking chicken or pork or whatever, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to cut that open on the grill and look inside. Is it good? Okay, we're ready. We're going to be safe here, right? We test the food that we're going to eat. How about our own health? Frequently, I hear people say, oh, yeah, something's going on. So-and-so isn't feeling well. This is happening. We don't know quite what's going on, but they're going in for tests, and hopefully we'll figure out what's happening. And that testing takes place, and then hopefully doctors... Uh, we'll know how to better treat whatever's going on with that patient, right? So testing is important with our health. Testing is important for electricians, for plumbers. We want them to know what they're doing. Hopefully they've gone through a time of training and testing so that when they come into our house, they know what to do and not like burn the whole thing down. How about doctors? Would you like a brain surgeon that hasn't gone through much testing in life? You know, hey, I, I, was, <laughs> I watch this on television all the time. I'm a good brain surgeon, you know? You probably would not let me do brain surgery on you because I don't know anything about that. I could cut your hair, but that's about it. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> you know, we're familiar with testing in life. What about our faith? It needs testing too, right? That's something that uh, is very plain throughout the scriptures. At the beginning of this letter here, Peter wrote in chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, these trials, for a little while you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How do you know your faith is genuine, strong, and true? Well, when the trial comes, you don't just like, I'm not a Christian anymore. 
you cling to Christ all the more. A person whose faith is not robust, not strong, will fall. The person will fail. That suffering will overwhelm them. But a person who trusts in the Lord Jesus, has genuine faith, knows when that trial comes, I'm going to be able to withstand it because I trust in Jesus. I trust God has my, my benefits here in mind. Okay? So chapter 1, verse 7, that tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. One more thing, one more thing that we think about in the scripture that's tested, right? The testing of gold comes because it, it removes the impurities. As that heat turns up, the impurities are removed so that we have pure gold here. And he says in the same way, there's this fiery trial that's coming upon you. Now, it could be that Peter is actually referring to fire. After all, I've read to you a couple of times here some of the accounts of history that talked about what happened to Christians during Nero's reign. And there's this whole thing that happened where much of Rome was burned and the Christians were blamed for that and Nero expanded his, his palace and so forth and there was lots of rumors that he caused it. We don't know about that. It's a good chance even the closest guards around Nero thought that he had caused this fire. We also know that Nero also doused some Christians in oil and set them on fire up on poles up high to be illuminated uh, at his garden parties. So it could be that Peter is referring to actual fire, those trials that are coming that none of us could imagine going through. But more than anything, fire here in the Bible often refers to God's own judgment and his testing here. So this fiery trial is probably just an image for all of us that are going to go through trials in order for our faith to be strengthened. So suffering is this common thing that's going to come upon every Christian. And he says, you should rejoice when that happens in verse 13. Rejoice in the suffering. Why? Because you're doing it in good company. When you're suffering for the Lord, hey, Jesus went before us. Jesus suffered to do the Father's, the Father's will as well. So you should rejoice when you share in Christ's suffering here. And he says, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Have you had your name ever drugged through the mud, gossiped about? And not because you did something stupid, but because... You're a Christian. If you have here, we want to get frustrated about that. We want to like lash back out at people. We want to go and explain, you've got it all wrong. But he says here, hey, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, <laughs> you're doing something right. You're blessed. You're blessed by God because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You're in good company. But he reminds us here, it's not just suffering in general. Like if you hear, hey, if you suffer, you're blessed. So we think, okay, how can I bring suffering upon myself? Maybe I could, if I could go steal some stuff from John, uh, then, you know, I could suffer for that. That would be awesome. No, he says here, and you know, it seems like an obvious thing that shouldn't have to be said, but if you're a parent of kids, you know you have to cover every little detail just to make sure that they know this isn't okay, this is okay. And Peter does that here. Um, he says here, hey, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. He's like, don't be getting into other people's business if you have no place there. Okay, Murder, stealing stuff, being an evildoer, that's not the kind of suffering we're talking about. We're talking about suffering for the name of Christ. Because you bear his name and you may go through trials and suffer that's where the blessing of the Lord is. And then again, he says in verse 16 there, Christian, that's your name. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Christian. So chapter 4, verse 16 is one of three places in the whole New Testament for this name, Christian. It also happens a couple of places in Acts. Acts chapter 11, verse 26, and chapter 26, verse 28 uh, it's there that the disciples are first called Christians in Antioch. That's from 1126. And then also King Agrippa, when Paul is standing before him, he, he uses that term with Paul too. 
he looks at Paul and he says, you know, really? Are you trying to make me a Christian already? <laughs> you know? So this word Christian, which we are very familiar with, which is thrown around very simply today, uh, was probably used as more like a derogatory term. It was given to these people who follow Christ from outsiders, not from the inside, okay? Christian, you know, those people that they get together and they have their hidden love feasts, you know, and they eat the flesh and blood of Jesus, you know, those weird people. Nobody really likes those people. They don't, they don't follow the ways of the world. They think they're better than the rest of us, okay? Those Christians, that's the way that word is often used here. But here he, he uses that word. He says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of the name you wear. I ask you today, are you ashamed of him? How would we know? How would the world know that you're ashamed of Jesus if you are? I think it kind of comes down to what we see. Maybe the, the works you're doing or not doing, the fruit of the Spirit. Do you have it or not? Maybe it'd be helpful to think about a, a parent-child analogy here. Uh, we were just having a conversation with another young family in my living room ooh, a couple weeks ago. And... Um, this one mom from Salt Lake City had come up to, to visit us. She had a couple of kids. And one of the young ladies is, gonna, is at teen camp starting uh, today up at Camp Ivydale. And um, we were talking about uh, the mom. Jen had said, um, well, I, I kind of wanted to see if I could volunteer and help maybe in the kitchen or something so that I could be there. And her daughter's like, no. <laughs> uh, you don't need to be there, okay? I, I don't mind my independence a little bit. And the mom's like, okay, you know. And she didn't mean it disrespectfully, but I think she kind of wanted her own space. But we can almost take that a little bit as, was that, was that young girl ashamed of her mom around other people? Maybe we as parents could think that about our kids. You know, when the kid does something that's really great and looks good and reflects well on me, I'm going to go, yeah, that's my kid. Chip off the old block, you know what I'm saying? You know, but then, <laughs> but then when my child does something that's hugely embarrassing for me, I don't want to tell anybody about it, you know? I just want to sweep that under the carpet and pretend like that never happened. Am I being ashamed of my child because of what they do? Maybe that's helpful for us to think here. Are you ashamed of Jesus? When it comes up in your life that you have opportunities to take shortcuts, do you take them? If you are, maybe you're ashamed of Jesus. If Sunday morning comes and you have an opportunity to gather with His people, but you're a little tired and you want to sleep in, maybe you're ashamed of Jesus. If you have opportunities to serve other people, but you think, oh, I, that person just doesn't really deserve it, you know, I, I'm so busy and, you know, well, maybe you're ashamed of Jesus. All of this is the way we talk. Do you use the Lord's name in vain? Do you throw it around like everyone else? Is your language that of a Christian or not? Are you ashamed of Jesus? There's sobering words in Luke chapter 9, verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. You do not want God to be ashamed of you. You want him to be proud of you as a son, as a daughter. Someday when you face him, you want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. You don't want to hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. I'm ashamed of you. You don't want to hear those words. And Peter reminds us here at the tail end of this chapter here that judgment is coming. We heard about that last week for the beginning of this chapter here. Judgment is coming. It is a sure deal that every person will stand before the Lord as our great and righteous judge at some point. Hebrews 9.27 tells us that after death, that's been appointed once to die. After that, 
judgment. You'll stand before the Lord and give an accounting for everything that you've said and done. And what you haven't said and done, you'll give an accounting for that. And so Peter reminds us here, verse 17, it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. He says it begins with us, okay? We're his kids, <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm mindful of that where in my own community here, you know, if I see some kids misbehaving, running around the park and causing trouble or whatever, part of me wants to go out and say, hey, stop that, you know? And I do that sometimes. Uh, maybe not quite the way I just said it now. Um, but when it's not my kid, I'm a little bit more like, well, not my problem, you know? But when it's my own kids that are out there, like swinging on a tree and break off a branch, you can bet I'm going to go out and correct it and make them clean it up because they're my kids. And so here, when Peter says judgment is coming and it begins with us, it begins with the household of God, he's going to judge us first. We're his kids, his sons and his daughters, okay? We especially need to be ready right here and now. And then he says, if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So if you're, if you're freaking out a little bit here because judgment is starting with us, he says, but at least we are his children. We are his house, the, in the household of God. And he said, he's quoting from Proverbs eleven thirty one. 31. He says, if the righteous is scarcely saved, and it's not, don't think of scarcely as, well, God will just barely save you because he has barely enough power to do so. No, it's humanity is so sinful. <laughs> you know, it's like we're, we're rescued just barely from our own our own destruction that we bring upon ourselves here. If we're scarcely saved or barely saved because of our own actions here, what's going to become of the ungodly and the sinner, the disobedient, those that don't follow the Lord's ways? If He's going to judge us as His people, you can be sure those who don't obey the Lord will face judgment, and it'll be a terrifying time. So today... What does living as an exile look like from this passage? Verse 19, it finishes and tells us, Therefore let us who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. As an exile here in this place, in this time, and we go through suffering, we go through trials, we entrust our souls to Him, the faithful one who will never leave us nor forsake us. He will always stand by us, and we can cling to Him through the trials. All things we can face, Philippians 4.13 tells us, because of Christ's strength. We can get through any of it here. So, as an exile, we entrust our souls to God while we go through suffering. And that should be an encouraging thing. There's been... There's some pretty hard stuff that we hear today, but I want you to come away being encouraged. You who are in Christ are a son and a daughter of God. You know He stands with you. You know your end is secured if you are in Christ. You know that you can get through suffering and trials standing with Him because He will be standing with you. You'll make it through.